Hi guys and welcome to the second lecture for chapter 15. This time we're going to be going into detail about what fossil fuels are, how they are extracted, how they are used, what are the benefits of fossil fuels, and what some of the drawbacks of fossil fuels are. Now, before we get into too much, we're going to go over some of the broad definitions for fossil fuels. This is a term you guys should have heard numerous times, either in this class uh, specifically or in numerous other classes throughout your education. But just to get, attach a definition, fossil fuels are highly combustible substance, substances formed over millions of years deep underground. They are a primary source of energy for our global energy market and our global energy demands. Basically, they supply 80%, roughly 80% of our energy needs, and we use them in three major forms or the three conventional fossil fuels are coal our solid fossil fuel oil our liquid fossil fuel and natural gas our gaseous fossil fuel now fossil fuels are formed over a very long period of time through a very heat intensive and pressure intensive process basically what happens is that organic matter is sub is sequestered deep underground and subjected to enormous amounts of heat and pressure over millions and millions of years interestingly enough whether organic matter turns into coal or whether it turns into oil or natural gas depends on where it first originated from terrestrial sources of organic matter tend to end up as coal whereas oceanic sources of organic matter tend to end up as either oil or natural gas. And again, these substances take millions and millions of years to form, so they are effectively non-renewable resources. Once we've used them all up, they are gone forever. So first, let's talk about the most abundant fo conventional fossil fuel, and that's going to be our solid fossil fuel, coal. Coal is again going to be that solid, hard, black hydrocarbon mixture that is formed from terrestrial substances being sequestered, being shoved deep underground and un subjected to heat and pressure for millions and millions of years. Now, coal is again the most abundant fossil fuel, and coincidentally, the United States has the largest coal reserves in the entire world. Coal is primarily used for electricity. Basically, we burn coal in our power plants to, sh to bring electricity to you and me, to heat our homes, and to power our many different appliances. It is extracted in a number of different ways that we went over in Chapter 11, but primarily coal is extracted being via strip mining, subsurface mining, and in mountaintop removal mining. And although coal is incredibly useful in terms of its ability to supply energy to our homes and power our appliances, there are several major issues with coal. First and foremost, that it is a fossil fuel and contributes enormously to greenhouse gases, but in addition, coal isn't a very pure hydrocarbon. In addition to simply having the hydrocarbon chains that we actually burn for fuel, coal often has a lot of impure byproducts as well. Things like sulfur, mercury, arsenic, and other trace metals, which can get released into the air after we burn coal. In addition to the pollution that's associated with burning coal in our power plants, just the methods in with which we extract coal cause enormous damage on no normal ecosystems. We went over most of this in chapter 11, but at things like acid mine drainage, ecosystems, ecosystem degradation and ecosystem complete removal when we talk about mountaintop removal and some of the other forms of extraction take an enormous toll on native ecosystems and can poison native ecosystems for years and years and years long after the coal has actually been extracted. In addition to all of this, coal is pretty unsafe to mine. Coal dust can get into the lungs of the workers and cause something called black lung, which is a terminal illness. And you have things such as mine collapses and mine fires, all of which can be extremely detrimental to the people who are actually extracting coal in the first place. So while coal is the most abundant fossil fuel, and while it does power the majority of the world's electricity and, satisfy the ma and satisfies the majority of the world's electrical needs, there are several major issues with coal that we need to take note of. Aside from the fact that it's a non-renewable resource and aside from the fact that it's a fossil fuel contributing to CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, coal also is a major source of pollution. It causes enormous amounts of damage to local ecosystems and it is extremely detrimental to the people who are actually working in coal and extracting it for us to burn. Now, the next conventional fossil fuel is oil, or our liquid hydrocarbon fossil fuel. Oil is essentially defined as a liquid hydrocarbon mixture, primarily formed from aggregations of ancient phytoplankton. Remember that, in contrast to coal, oil and natural gas are formed by phytoplankton in the ocean, settling out of suspension, being sequestered into the ground, and subjected to enormous heat and pressure over millions and millions of years, and eventually forming oil after all of that heat and pressure is actually changed and work those hydrocarbons in certain ways. Now, the primary use of oil is transportation. We use a form of oil 
gasoline specifically, to power our cars and our automobiles and other vehicles. Now, it also should be noted that oil isn't oil when we take it from the ground. The, the substance that we actually extract from the ground is known as crude oil, and it needs to undergo a refining process before we can really begin to use it. Now, there are several forms or methods of extraction from oil, and usually they occur one after another. For each method of extraction after the previous method of extraction, the energy returned on investment value drops a little bit. So, first and foremost, we have our primary extraction. This is essentially where we drill a hole in the ground and the pressure of the oil actually pushes the oil straight up and into our, into our barrels. After the primary extraction pressure has subsided and the oil is no longer just being pumped out of the ground, we actually inject solvents, sometimes water, sometimes other liquids into the ground and we actually force the oil up. After we are able, after we've gotten all the crude oil out from that method, we then go back and use steam and other chemicals in a form called tertiary extraction, in which we get the very last remaining bits of oil. Again, it should be noted that each time we do an additional method of extraction, the energy return on investment ratio drops, meaning that we are investing more and more energy and getting less energy out, respectively, for each method of extraction that we attempt. Now, just like coal, there are many issues associated with oil. There are a lot of air pollution associated with oil because again it is a very impure hydrocarbon so you get things like carbon dioxide you get sulfur dioxide different forms of nitrogen oxides as we burn this oil and as we burn this fossil fuel in addition to that there is a serious threat of water pollution remember that oil is found in reserves that are deep offshore so if there's an accident and oil spills come out such as, such as the deep water horizon oil spill there can be enormous impacts to the local ecosystems and ecosystems even hundreds of miles away. In addition to all of this, just like coal, oil is a fossil fuel, and by burning oil, we are contributing to CO2 emissions into the atmosphere and causing climate change. Now, the final conventional fossil fuel that we're going to talk about is natural gas. Natural gas is a gaseous hydrocarbon that is primarily composed of methane, or CH4. Now, the primary use of natural gas is to generate electricity, specifically to generate electricity in the form of heat or to cook. So basically, we're using it to heat our homes or to cook our foods. Now, extraction of natural gas is a little bit complicated. It takes a while to find it. It's very tricky to find. So normally what they do is they undergo a process known as exploratory drilling, in which they drill different holes in uh, areas that are likely to have natural gas and seeing if they can actually extract any. Otherwise, natural gas is formed from the heating of coal or oil and allowing the methane to rise as a byproduct of those refining processes. Now, natural gas is actually the fastest growing fossil fuel in use today. Liquefied natural gas, or basically natural gas or methane that is compressed down to where it is actually liquid, can be stored and transported and pumped miles and miles away from the extraction point. In addition to that, methane or natural gas is actually the cleanest burning fossil fuel. Methane is very efficient and has very few impurities, so it actually it actually emits the fewest amount or the fewest quantities of carbon dioxide with each unit burned. It can emit as low as half as much carbon di dioxide as coal and as little as two-thirds of the carbon dioxide emitted by oil. However, it is very flammable and it is very dangerous to ship as well as harness. Now that we've gone over the three major forms of fossil fuels that we use for energy needs, we're going to go over a few terms known known as unconventional fossil fuels. Unconventional fossil fuels are simply going to refer to hydrocarbon fuels, which are not as readily used yet as the, for, as the major three, coal, oil, and natural gas. So unconventional fossil fuels refer to things like oil sands, oil shale, and something called methane hydrate, all of which we're going to be going over in just a sec. So the first form of unconventional fossil fuels that we're going to talk about are oil sands. However, before we get into that, we need to briefly define a substance known as bitumen. Bitumen is a thick, black, heavy form of petroleum, and it's found consistently in oil sands. If you want to know what bitumen looks like, it's going to be the image on your center screen right in front of you. Now, oil sands are basically moist sand or clay that contain between 1 and 20 percent bitumen. Basically, they result from crude oil deposits being degraded by water, weather, or bacteria. So, these are very common in places like Canada and the northern United States, and these are generally 
easily extracted via open pit mining or strip mining because it is right on the surface of the, uh, of the earth. The next unconventional fossil fuel that we'll be talking about is something called oil shale. Oil shale is sedimentary rock filled with organic matter, which can be processed into a liquid form of petroleum. Basically, we call it shale oil. So it is extracted primarily through uh, strip mining or subsurface mining, very similar to coal. And again, it can be broken down and processed into a liquid form of petroleum known as shale oil. Now, there is a large amount of oil shale. In fact, the world's supplies are estimated to be equal to about 600 billion barrels of shale oil, which is an enormous supply. And so when you look at either oil sand or oil shale, the consistent theme is that there is a lot of it. So the question is, why aren't we using it as readily as we use oil or coal. And the problem is that these uh, reserves of unconventional fossil fuels are very hard to extract and they are very hard to process into a form that is usable. So whereas conventional fossil fuels have a very high energy return on investment value, unconventional fossil fuels have a very low energy return on investment value. They're much harder to process, extract, and turn into a form that is actually usable. So these unconventional fossil fuels are only really going to be profitable to extract when market value for conventional fossil fuels are already really, really high. Then you can turn, you can have a very quick return on investment, and you can very quickly and easily sell these in a way that is economically viable. Now, the last unconventional fossil fuel is, in my opinion, the coolest, and that is methane hydrate. Methane hydrate is basically this ice-like crystal lattice that has methane molecules embedded into this crystal structure of ice. And methane hydrate occurs in Arctic locations, either in the Arctic or the Antarctic, deep underwater. Surveys roughly estimate that there is potentially twice as much methane hydrate as reserves of oil, natural gas, and coal combined. However, the problem is we really don't know how to safely extract it. The extraction could release enormous amounts of methane into the atmosphere, contributing to enormous increases in climate change and global warming. Methane is a very, very potent uh, greenhouse gas. And so if we don't do, if we don't extract it correctly, we could just be releasing enormous amounts amounts of methane into the atmosphere and heating up the planet very, very rapidly. So while there's a lot of methane hydrate underwater right now, we don't really know how to extract it in a way that is safe and economically viable. So we went over it slightly when we talked initially about energy return on investment, but we need to really go over some of the economics of extraction. As we improve our technologies, more and more fossil, reserve, fossil fuel reserves become available to be extracted. However, market demand and pricing are actually going to determine which oil and which fossil fuel reserves are actually extracted versus which are not. Some are simply not profitable to extract, even though we have the technology to extract them. Basically, EROI, that energy return on investment that we originally talked about in a, the previous lecture, really becomes a factor here. Because when it becomes too costly to extract a given fossil fuel reserve, we're not going to try and do it. So if prices for fossil fuels are very high, suddenly a lot of secondary extraction and unconventional extraction methods are suddenly very profitable. However, if fossil fuel prices are very low, these unconventional forms of fossil fuel extraction are not really going to be very profitable. And so many companies are not really going to invest in the technology in order to extract them. So when we were talking about conventional fossil fuels and specifically oil, we mentioned that when we first extracted oil out of the ground in the form of crude oil, it had very, it was very limited in the ways that we could actually use them. And this goes for most fossil fuels, in fact. Conventional fossil fuels are very limited in their uses in their raw form, the form in which we extract them from the ground. After we extract them, often we need to go through a form of processing in order to prepare them for how we're going to use them as energy sources. Now, this process is known as as refining. Refining is essentially a process of separating out the different hydrocarbon molecules by size and then chemically transforming them into purified fuels. These are going to offer ways to get a very diverse range of uses out of the original raw fossil fuel form. Now, this is going to often be through a form of heating. You basically heat the crude oil or heat the raw fossil fuel in order to get it to separate out by density. And then once it is separated out by density, you are then 
then able to extract each individual form of the processed fossil fuels, and then you can use it in a number of different ways. Now, while the higher octane or the higher value fossil fuels that are separated out during the refining process are often used for fuels, be it in transportation or in electricity generation, there are also many other byproducts of the refining process that we actually make readily, readily available and take advantage of. A lot of our household products are actually based on petroleum. Many plastics, for example, are the result of petroleum products. And so I'll let you spend some time here and check out all of the different gadgets and appliances that we that wouldn't be possible without some of the fossil fuels that we use and these different petroleum products. Now, that is everything we have for the fossil fuel lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time for the Reaching for Fossil Fuels lecture. Take care.